Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this edition of Defense News Weekly, we're looking at the future of certain Army units, from striker brigades to aviation units to short-range air defense. We'll talk directly with the Army leaders heading those efforts and get you the latest news on their work and when new tech will hit the field. With in-depth interviews, up-close video, and leading analysis, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome to this week's edition of Defense News Weekly. I'm Jeff Martin, here from Tampa, Florida, where we're working on a very special project that you'll see in the coming months. In this week's show, though, we're going to focus on the Army's modernization and how it's looking to get new capabilities to soldiers much faster than it has in the past. Up first is a look at the Striker Brigade of the Future. Now, the Army's looking to add everything from 30mm cannons to anti-tank capabilities to a new network to its Striker Combat Brigades. Now, in order to find out the timeline of that and when we're going to see those efforts come to fruition, I talked to the Army's program head, Colonel William Venable. So it's safe to say that the strikers we see in 2022, 23, 24 are not gonna, exactly going to look like a lot of the strikers that we see out in the field right now. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the fleet? It, we've, you're looking at equipping the 30 millimeter on, on the strikers and everything yes. like that. Is that going to be all the ICVs, in, the, the infantry variant in those brigades, or will there be some still traditional, uh, so-called traditional strikers? Yeah, so, uh, so I'll start by saying that in FY22, we intend to feel the most modern Mm -hmm. most mobile, lethal, and survivable striker combat brigade team ever fielded, mm -hmm. and uh, a world-class mounted infantry force mm -hmm. and one-two infantry. Uh, and that will include the, the mobility uh, buybacks, the swap buybacks, the space weight and power buybacks for the DVHA-1 production with all of the lethality, the suite of capabilities that I mentioned earlier, uh, and network modernization. We've mm -hmm. got some efforts going on in that regard to prepare the platform and the formation for receiving the Army's modern tactical data network. Um, the 30 millimeter uh, cannon will go, we've been authorized to buy 269 systems. Mm -hmm. We'll put uh, 83 per uh, brigade combat team. Mm -hmm. The current con op that, we're, uh, that we've learned from the 2CR ONS fielding, which mm -hmm. has these similar capabilities, that'll culminate uh, this year, this fall, mm -hmm. is uh, they're used in uh, the, the, the 30 millimeter cannons are used in combination with other capabilities such as Javelin, Crows J, and LRAS mm -hmm. to acquire targets and then engage uh, on the battlefield. So mm -hmm. it'll go in a limited number of ICBs mm -hmm. per brigade. Right, and then finally, as we wrap up, we'll can, you mentioned it there, and that was my one. It's important to note, too, Jeff, that even when we, so all the designs, even when we put the 30 millimeter cannon on top of the vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, the most important aspect of the vehicle. Carrying troops. Remains unchanged. There's still nine guys in the back yeah. of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Nine it. highly qualified infantrymen. And so with that, giving them even more capability beyond just the 30 minutes, the Javelin for anti-tank capability. How right. is the, how's the integration going there for the for the weapon station? Uh, well, we have some, uh, so we're integrating Javelin on, on RWS mm -hmm. and a specific uh, set of constraints for this vehicle. Uh, we're harvesting RWSs off of, uh, off of uh, the flat bottom fleet mm -hmm. and, then, and then upgrading them to the the javelin under armor capability. We have some technical risk that we're managing. Uh, I think it's uh, safe to say that we're going to slip fielding from this summer. It was, if you may remember, it was accelerated by a year mm -hmm. uh, from 2CR in Europe to 2 Ford Infantry in Colorado that I mentioned earlier. Uh, because of the technical risk that we encountered in this latest test cycle, mm -hmm. we're going to have to. Uh, to slip the fielding. And when a was few that months. test cycle? Just because. So we just completed a, a operational assessment, uh, early user assessment event, mm -hmm. uh, three weeks ago. Okay. And uh, had some technical difficulties in that, which we've since fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll have to get get the fix back into the system, get back into the test cycle, and mm -hmm. then come out with a material release for fielding. So. Um, other than that, I think the capability itself works great. Mm -hmm. the, the technical risk wasn't associated with the lethality or the functionality of the system. Yeah, well, it's a pretty darn good missile and can do what it's designed to do. It's been in the field a long time. It's a proven, combat proven, and mm -hmm. so is the RWS for that matter. It was just the marrying up of the two, mm -hmm. getting them to talk to each other. The fire control stations down below in the hall, mm -hmm. uh, getting uh, all that integrated into a, a new suite of computing and, and presentation capabilities was, has been technically challenging for the team. But uh, 
I think we'll be on track for the one two fielding, mm -hmm. or the correction, the two CR fielding, and followed by the one two fielding. So you expect next uh, just to clarify, just to make sure I'm next summer for the two CR, and then uh, next summer, next yep. summer, and then one two after that. No, gentlemen, thanks, thanks for the time. Thanks I appreciate right, you guys yeah. here today. It's enjoy the rest of the show. All right, thank you. Now, while much of the Pentagon and the U.S. defense establishment is focused on the Pacific region for when it comes to a future war, Europe is still incredibly important, especially for the United States Army. So we talked to Lieutenant General Retired Mark Hurtling, who used to command Army forces in that theater, to get his take on what's needed there, especially as Russia continues to become a threat. So one thing we hear from the Pentagon all the time is the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific, it seems to be the number one focus. Yet yeah. Europe at the same time is just important. From your experience, how do you balance that that fight in the resource halls, in the, in the halls of the Pentagon for resources when it comes to saying that, hey, we're important too? <laughs> well, it's interesting because that was the opposite of the fight we had a few years ago, which mm -hmm when the ba rebalancing toward the Pacific took place, mm -hmm. a lot of us stood up and said, yeah, hey, wait a minute, we've got some great alliances over here and some certain threats. Uh, but again, you have to take a look at how do you balance in all the theaters of operations mm -hmm. for the Army? And when you see the threats in some areas that are not the typical kinds of threats that we've seen in the past, mm -hmm. uh, you really have to allocate the forces and the resources to those. And uh, we fought that uh, while I was there. Mm -hmm. I know the commander of Europe, John Cavoli, is still fighting that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important to get that right, and it's hard because not everybody can get what they want. Do you think they have enough? I don't. Uh, I'm gonna, I can honestly say that now as a retiree. <laughs> uh, they absolutely do not have enough, and I can share in each area in each function what they don't have enough of. Uh, intelligence, air defense, and, and all the things that we were fighting for mm -hmm. and General Hodge fought for as the forces were drawing down are the things that people are saying, oh gee, we could use a little of that in Europe. Well, we had it there and it's a lot harder to bring it back unless you do the reforger redux, as you call it, than just having folks stationed there. Mm -hmm. and, and truthfully, the argument is always, you know, if, if part of the alliance is building trust you need to be there to build trust. You just can't have continual rotational forces. Mm -hmm. You have to actually have forces on the ground. Is there one area that you see as the number one need? Is it long-range fires? Is it EW? Is it intelligence? Is it, is it air defense? Well, everybody's going to mention cyber. Mm -hmm. Everyone is going to men mention air and missile defense. Mm -hmm. Everyone is going to talk about the ability to get special operators on the ground. And then uh, intelligence across the board. I mean, at one time we had a couple of intelligence brigades over there, and we now have a reduced intelligence uh, organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, those are the kind of things that you're passing information between countries and between armies. All of that is critical, and, and NATO, truthfully, looks for us to lead the way. So yeah, I would say, you know, we could put a list on the table and I could go through each one of them and say, we've got a lot, enough of this, not so much of this, and we need more of this, but all commanders do that. So while aircraft have been a big focus of the Army's future vertical lift program, sensors and weapons are a huge part of the Army's work in that area. So in order to find out more about what the Army's looking for, Jen Judson moderated a panel of experts at AUSA's 2019 exposition. Here's what they had to say. Let's talk about the piece that you know, I, I think gets a little less attention than the airframe, <laughs> um, which is you know modular open systems architectures and some of the other capabilities that will be going on these platforms. It's not just going to be about you know this helicopter flying. It's going to be about what is part is in the helicopter flying. Uh, so can you talk about some of the efforts that you're you know that are coming online that you're that you're starting to develop um, that you see being you know integral to. Um, being a part of future vertical lift. Yeah, so uh, again, our s and is, is uh, laser-like aligned with our, our RDT and then uh, eventually our procurement. Obviously, our modular open system approach and architecture is one of our lines of effort. We feel like it's fundamental. Um, again, it's fundamental to upgrade at the pace of technology to really uh, fully integrate our avionics space. We don't just have big black boxes back there that we have yeah. the multi-core processing but it's also to ensure that there's not vendor lock. So we want to upgrade quickly, and we want to prevent uh, vendors from just locking down uh, with their IP and data rights. And so we're doing that through uh, a government-defined standard and a government-defined interface. So think of the USB cable that plugs into any computer, and you can use that mouse or whatever uh, peripheral. So that's the concept. Uh, I think uh, what you're seeing in practice is our mission system architecture demo is on contract. We have uh, five performers with seven industry partners. We're going to award two more uh, next quarter. Uh, and really that capstone demonstration is going to finish up 
uh, a year from December, so December 2020, and is really feeding into uh, what will be a government furnished equipment, a GFE, MOSA, into both platforms. Um, you saw out at our Western Test Range, uh, out at China Lake, a federated approach to that with uh, the Stellar Relay. Uh, you know, we had the Stellar Relay in the Gray Eagle. That that uh, relay got the airworthiness release, which is not a small task from uh, our engineering directorate. But then we were able to plug in payloads that didn't have to go through that uh, that airworthiness release process and sometimes lengthy process mm -hmm. to get onto the aircraft. And so, one, we were able to do that with very innovative small companies. Um, we were able to do it very quickly. Uh, and th some of those payloads are heading to combat next month. Wow. So we are very proud of that. And, and again, we're showing that open system approach. Yeah, I, I think sensors and payloads is what it's all about, being able to rapidly adapt and not have to kind of go back to zero every time we want to add something to the platform. <laughs> Uh, so I think that's critically important. And I think another good point is right there at the end when General Rugen talked about things that are that we're able to take to combat soon. These are some of the spin-offs you're seeing from some of the great work the CFT's doing that are kind of, you know, going back to those fleets we just discussed. Yeah. And I think the mission systems are, are critical, as has been said. So much of the capability there is now in the software. Uh, you know, not that the hardware isn't important, but it's really generating digitized uh, outputs and streams of information that can be shared throughout the system and throughout the battlefield. And so uh, that's the opportunity here and where I think you can integrate that more seamlessly on a new design system and a new architecture of the mission systems uh, than you could if you were just trying to backfit on, onto the exert existing fleet. And some of that backfit's definitely going to happen, uh, but there'll be a little bit of a kludge. And to have a design where it can be fully integrated uh, is a huge advantage. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit more about air launch defects. That's like another sort of category that fits into it. You know, we talk about sensors and payloads and things like that, but we also talk about you know, being able to fly unmanned or, you know, munitions right off of a helicopter that can help um, te and team up and, and maybe get even further ahead out, out towards the threat uh, than a helicopter itself, creating standoff, things like that. I mean, you're doing a lot of um, evaluation with uh, some of this stuff. Can you speak to some of those efforts that you're doing now? I, I think when we talked about uh, a new way, you know, the aviation functional concept in multi-domain operations, uh, we, we brought in some of our best warfighters to really look at how we could iterate on this functional concept and make us highly lethal and survivable in a uh, peer, near peer threat. Um, we went into a high fidelity model uh, that the Air Force uses because we wanted to use someone else's uh, physics-based model, not Army Zone. Mm -hmm. We went to the intelligence community, so we got a, a threat template that was, uh, again, outside of the Army to ensure that you know, the veracity of our, our model uh, and the quality of our model was of the highest sort. And what that model really told us is that we needed some air launched effects to help us find, fix, and finish our pacing threats. And so the people that are hunting us, we want to hunt them uh, and we want to stay outside of their, you know, engagement zone where they can detect us. And so that's the concept very simply. Um, what we saw in our modeling and then in subsequent tests out in uh, China Lake and Yuma Proving Ground was an ability to uh, keep our surrogate platform, so our FARA surrogate masked uh, behind terrain, uh, take MDO relevant shots at very low altitudes, uh, fly our effects over terrain, and then uh, basically finish them uh, even if they're on a reverse slope of that terrain. So we went over about 1,600 feet of relief um, with our drones. Uh, we went. 11 for 11 on missile shots, again in, a, in an S&T environment, but we were very uh, proud of it. I think it culminated with a, uh, a shot at night to a moving target. Um, and again, it was all outside of the uh, engagement zones of, of the, really the weapon systems, the enemy weapon systems that are hunting us. Um, the air launched effects are, uh, you know, they need a mothership to bring them to uh, close the distance in MDO to, uh, to bring them to the forward line uh, of troops. Uh, and so what you're seeing in, in some of our tenants in, in, uh, in our aviation functional concept is operating from sanctuary, using that speed and, and endurance and, uh, and uh, agility to kind of close that distance and then send out our drones to, to fight and hunt. 
think ALE, you know, that's what that's kind of what creates the ecosystem. You have the platform as, as the mothership, you have the, the ALE out there creating the ecosystem along with the architecture. Uh, you know, I think this is the next evolution of, of kind of unmanned technology and, and blurring the lines between unmanned and other effects. Uh, but when you think about unmanned, and you know, we kind of fell in love with unmanned during the coin fight where we there really wasn't an air threat and we could just leave something sitting up there. Yeah. Now we're discovering other things that we can do with these uh, these advanced effects and, and how to team them. And then I think when you when you put that together with the extended reach of the platform, being being able to operate from sanctuary uh, in the beginning, you, you further increase the survivability of the, of the mother platform. To keep up to date with all of our coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn pages. Also, be sure to add us on Apple's news app and other platforms for the latest updates. And when we come back, we're going to look at how the United States needs to prepare for a future conflict. There's a new phrase entering the defense establishment, left of conflict. But what exactly does it mean? Well, it means looking at a conflict and doing everything you can before to be ready for it when it arrives. To learn more about what the U.S. Army is doing in that regard, I talked to Lieutenant General Eric Wesley at the AUSA, AUSA 2019 Exposition. Here's what he had to say. So on the timeline side, we have the, what's the, what, from your perspective, what's the difference between these 20, things we hear about for 2028 versus further on? What? Well, look, uh, an Army is always continuing to modernize. What the Secretary of the Army, Chief Staff of the Army published in the, in the vision statement is this idea that we want to be a multi-domain operational capable Army by 2028. That doesn't mean we don't do multi-domain now, but in the way we describe it, where you're continuously in, in a high-speed and a large-scale battlefield able to integrate all domains effectively um, is something that we are, we're targeting 2028 and then and then beyond because um, being able to transcend that across the force and uh, is something we'll be seeking out. So jump back on time. Well, a couple of years ago, I remember here at AOS that we heard, we saw multi-domain battle kind of everywhere, but there was kind of this general, it was kind of a nebulous, no one really, we're two years later now, We've got an idea, you've got the concept, you've got that. What does it say to you for the speed at which you guys have been able to put this together? Well, I, actually, I think um, what you may not be aware of is originally after Multi-Domain Battle was published, we were going to publish a second version with more detail in two years. We accelerated that by a year. Um, we didn't cut any corners, though, because the difference between MDB and MDO, MDB was a theory, and multi-domain operations has been validated with exceeding the number of experimentation and detail and rigor that demonstrates how you would execute it. So I think we've we've um, put rigor to it, and we've put experimentation to it, we've been able to validate that theory that we postulated with multi-domain battle. So lots of different unique weapons that we're seeing and, and, and technologies that we're seeing, but one other one is social media, and how do you use it? and information Information warfare being part of MDO. How do you see social media and others being part of that? Well, it's it's, it's fundamental, mm -hmm. particularly in the competition space. The nation that invests and participates in competition will determine the outcome mm -hmm. of any given future war. Now, even if you don't fight in the future, even if we assume that we won't have a war with a, a, a peer competitor, absent competing, left of conflict, you will see the nation that doesn't compete lose influence over time. So incrementally as a nation, we will have less in influence if we don't compete. A key part of competition is the ability to integrate information into everything that we do because ultimately these things that we engage in are all about people. Mm -hmm. And information is the medium by which they choose their course. So you, that phrase you use there, left to conflict. That's something where we title your, the panel you're on here today and uh, here at the show and everything like that. Left, does that mean preparing for the fight before you actually have it, or is it more in depth? No, I think it's more in depth. In, in, in years past, we would say that left of conflict is when you prepare for conflict. Um, that's still true, mm -hmm. but what we're finding is, particularly with our peers, is they're using that space left of conflict to achieve their operational and strategic objectives. Mm -hmm. and, and we have a long culture of, of not really participating in that space the way we should because we don't see ourselves as a warfighting people in our culture, our, our norms, our mores. Um, our competitors just see conflict as a, as a long continuum. It includes conflict and includes that space left of conflict competition. We need to be a little more aggressive, I think, and that's what the concept lays out, that we need to engage our competitors mm -hmm. early on before you get to conflict, expand that competition space, and what that, the effect of that is you can deter before you ever get to conflict. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that what this concept, unlike concepts in the past, which start at conflict, mm -hmm. um, what is fundamentally different about this concept is we talk about the information space and the competitive space and the actions we have to take 
in order to be successful. If that fails, the nation that invests in competition will be the most effective once conflict starts. And when you talk about investing in competition, is that force structure, is that capabilities, is that, or is it all kind of an all of the above? Because yeah. we see the Army in the past, they've contracted, ramped up in a major conflict. Is it keeping a steady force structure? Is it keep increasing your capabilities? It's a number of things. First of all, in terms of um, presence, we, we talk about calibrated force posture in our concept. And what that says is, if you want to compete, mm -hmm. you have to be there. You really have to be there. And why? Because again, it's about people. And so you have to be where those people are. So, so presence is an issue that we have to consider. I'm sure that our nation will uh, have the debate on the degree to which we are forward postured. Mm -hmm. um, but the other factor is that there are actions that take place, countering information warfare, um, any number of countering information operations. Mm -hmm. um, there's also aspects, though, of the requirement to always be able to see where your opponent will be mm -hmm. in the event of conflict. And that, that requires you to be able to stimulate them mm -hmm. so that you can identify where they're at, so that you can always have readily available a target list in yeah. the event that you have to rapidly transition to conflict. And so ultimately what we seek to do with this, if you can expand the competition space, you can deter war. If that expansion fails, you could very rapidly defeat a fait accompli attack. What we don't want, what we don't want is a nation that's got to go through a six-month mobilization in conflict with a peer state, because that doesn't end well. And when we come back, we're going to get a status update on the Army's short-range air defense modernization. On this week's Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack offers her latest tips. There's always news around the economy, predictions that it's going to be up one moment and in another it's going down. And the truth is, no one has a crystal ball. The better news is, you don't have to be an economist to create a plan for your financial future. It can start with something as simple as setting up a recurring transfer from your checking account into a savings account, putting your savings on autopilot. Even with as little as $25, your savings will add up over time and earn compound interest. That's easy money. You can also do the same thing with your bills and loans. Setting them up to be paid automatically means never missing a payment and, as an added bonus, builds your credit in the meantime. Now you can aim for longer term needs like buying a home or saving for retirement. Keep in mind, long term goals take time and focus, so try not to base decisions to buy or invest on a headline or news stories. Retirement accounts and real estate investments are proven over the long haul, so be patient in reaching your goals. If you're looking for more guidance, talk to your financial institution. There's a good chance they have resources online and advisors available to make sure your finances are strong no matter which way the market turns. To get more defense news coverage, be sure to visit our website and subscribe to our Early Bird Brief, which is delivered to your inbox every weekday morning to get you ready to start the day. And when we come back, we're going to get a status update on the Army's short-range air defense modernization. In Iraq and Afghanistan, short-range air defense wasn't something that the Army really needed. But now, as they look towards a future conflict, they realize that they do, in fact, need it. So in order to find out the status of getting a vehicle for that into the fleet, Jen Judson talked with two of the Army's experts leading that work at AUSA 2019. Here's what they had to say. You could tell us a little bit about um, what you have done to fill the short-range uh, air defense gap um, that we're particularly seeing in Europe um, over the past couple of years. Why don't we get started with that? So. Our first uh, uh, effort into filling the gap with the short range air defense was to do the maneuver short range air defense demonstration that we conducted in 2017. And at that point, we uh, engaged industry and we said, hey, what do you have on the shelf that you could bring to fill this particular gap? We ran a demo out at White Sands, and what we found was none of our industry partners had the exact material solution to fill the gap at the time. So we went back uh, and went through the Army Features Command to get a directed requirement that helped with shaping what that material solution needed to look like. And then we set off on an aggressive accelerated schedule to produce what we call today the initial maneuver short range air defense vehicle. Talk about who's participating in that. Um, sure. what, what exactly are you building to meet this capability? Okay, gap? so what we've done is we've taken a Striker A1 chassis and we've integrated air defense capabilities on top of it. And our industry partners that are part of that are Raytheon, 
General Dynamics Land Systems and also Leonardo DRS. Um, and you know, obviously, this is this is um, built off of a striker. Um, you have multiple uh, capabilities, you know, that you're putting on this. But you're also looking at doing some directed energy capability for uh, infrared. So we could talk a little bit also about um, what you're doing there. Uh, you know, what your time goals are to get this capability out. Um, you know, what the challenges are. So our timeline for the directed energy infrared effort is uh, four vehicles in FY22. Uh, we chose, or we didn't necessarily choose, we aligned the delivery of the directed energy variant of uh, the Amshorad solution to uh, fall into fielding of the IM Shorad, so that first battery could contain uh, two platoons of kinetic effectors and one platoon of a DE effector. That's all we have time for for this week's special edition from Tampa. Be sure to visit defensenews.com for more coverage. Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too.